My name is Deputy Sheriff Thomas Batista. I'm currently with the Windsor County Sheriff's Department. Uh, my primary role now is in, um, in administration. Uh, however, we still do a good amount of patrol. I'm also in charge of our snowmobile patrol program for Windsor County, for our department. Trails in Windsor County are challenging uh, at best. When you're out on the trails, we, ha we have a lot of winding, narrow trails um, versus like if you were up in Champlain, you'd have a lot of straighter, open trails that are, could be as, as wide as the interstate. And when I say challenging, uh, conditions can vary from within, I'll say a couple hundred feet. You may be on a nice, groomed, packed trail, come around a turn where there's been sun that was hitting it, and it got cold, that's all ice. It could be on an upgrade, downhill grade, um, anything of that nature that can narrow up. It could be rocks protruding, uh, water bars. Uh, again, you could have shadows and shading affecting your ability to see and navigate on certain areas and terrains of the trail. Also on any kind of frozen body of water, for, for example, you could have a nice sunny day. That may look like a nice flat surface. Go Start going across there, all of a sudden there could be jets in the ice, protruding the ice could have collapsed because of a spring. You can't tell until you're all of a sudden on it. And usually by that point, if you're going at an excessive speed, it, it could cause an issue. My name is Melissa Walker. On March 22nd, I was up for a snowmobile ride with my boyfriend Dave, and um, we took a ride to Shrewsbury, Vermont, which is near in our backyard pretty much. Um, we're very familiar with the trail. My name is uh, Michael Lines. Um, everybody calls me Spike. I'm the manager of the company here and owner. I was uh, standing here with my wife. I was actually working out in my shop, turning wrenches, and um, the call came in over the pager that there was a snowmobile accident in the Coolidge Day Forest. And I hollered to Mike and I went down the steep bank. Um, it was pretty difficult. The snow was deep. Um, it was over my knees. I mean, it was deep. At that point, I um, had made arrangements and got the snowmobiles and set ready to go to the rescue. Just tried to keep focusing on, you know, looking into his eyes and I just kept saying, you know, stay with me, stay with me, Mike. You know, keep breathing. My name is Rick Kaminsky and I live in Plymouth, Vermont. Uh, it was March 22nd and typically my wife rides with me because we each have sleds but she was busy that day with other projects. So I called up my daughter who lives three miles down the road and I asked if Mike would like to go for a ride with me this afternoon. Um, of course they just had a baby a couple of weeks ago so he, he's been tied up in the house doing doing uh, new family chores and he jumped at the chance he said he'd love to so I said why don't you meet me at the vast parking lot out behind spikes at 11 o'clock and we'll go for a couple hour ride so I loaded up the sleds and I went to the parking lot and of course Mike was already there he had his helmet in his hand he was ready to go so we hopped on our sleds and we crossed the road went up into the park um, did some loops around and decided to head west crossed route 100 went up into Shrewsbury kept on going out to Ludlow. Made a big loop around, headed back into the Coolidge homestead, put on about 50 or 60 miles. Now it's about 2.30 in the afternoon and we're, st we're stopped at the road crossing in 100A that crosses from the Coolidge homestead back up into the park, heading back toward the parking lot. And we stopped and took a break and we were talking and saying how great the trail conditions were, there's still tons of snow up in the mountains. Um, he thanked me for calling him up and inviting him to go sledding. And we were just having a, a good, good guy time together. We were just enjoying each other's company. But we were both getting a little anxious to head back home because we both had things to do. So we crossed 100A, went out through the field, and went up some steep hills. And I've been leading most of the way, and Mike's been following me, but I let him take lead. Uh, for the rest of the way home and he was riding a little more aggressively than I would normally ride but I let him go up ahead of me and we went up a steep hill and there was a sharp right hand turn at the top of the hill came around the corner and I saw this individual in the middle of the trail he was not on a sled I stopped my machine pulled over on the side and stopped and realized there was another individual down the down the embankment which was pretty steep um, who was in a lot of pain 
um, and was expressing he was in a lot of pain. And he lifts his head up and says, over here. And I said, Mike, are you hurt? And he says, yeah, I think I broke my leg. And I said, oh, Mike, don't move, Mike, don't move. But then I realized I knew the person in the trail on the phone um, um, as Rick, um, also from the same area, trying to call 911. I dial 911. 911, what's your emergency? Click. I lose reception. I look at my phone. I have no bars on my phone. I don't even know how I got through the first time. I try it again and again, and the same thing happens. Um, so I tried my cell phone, and thankfully, I received a 911 operator. Um, I was able to give them the location to the best of my ability. Um, you know, unless you know the trails, it's kind of difficult to pinpoint. Um, and told them that the individual clearly had a broken leg, um, was probably 30 to 50 feet down the steep embankment, and was um, expressing distress that he was unable to breathe. He kept saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Um, and, and I thought they should probably bring DART, which is a helicopter rescue team. And they assured me that the call would be sent out. And she hands me the phone, and the responder says, I've got your location. You need to go back to the road crossing. Rescue's on its way. Um, so I got off the cell phone. I called my, a relative of mine that I knew was on the Bridgewater Fast Squad, and I asked her to, to come up. She said, I'm in Ludlow. I'll be right there. Perfect. So now I felt you know, a little bit of relief that I knew she was on her way, and she's close. So Dave slops on, steps on his sled and heads back to the road that we just crossed. And Melissa jumps over the bank and says, I'm going to go down there and stay with Mike. Rick, you better go back to the road crossing because they're going to need help getting rescue people in. So Melissa wades her way down through that snow. Now it's almost way steep. It's really deep once you get off the trail. But she works her way down to Mike and she stays with him. And I go back to the road crossing waiting for rescue just tried to keep focusing on you know looking into his eyes and I just kept saying you know stay with me stay with me Mike you know keep breathing um, and he kept saying I can't breathe I can't breathe and I said well you're talking you're breathing the help is on the way um, again he you know I knew he was in a lot of pain he was worried about his leg I said yeah I'm pretty sure you know it'll be okay though you know if we're gonna get you out of here you're gonna be fine um, so you know we kept trying to reposition him because I knew he was uncomfortable. Um, and of course, not knowing what his injuries are, um, you know, I thought, well, maybe, you know, something's going on inside, but he wasn't spinning up any blood. And he kept saying, am I doing any blood? I said, no, you're great. As I'm riding through the field, heading out to the road, I see there's already a sheriff sitting there. Dave's making his way up to the road, and there's another sheriff coming in from the other direction. And I said, I don't know how they got there so quick, but. They must have got. They must have been on patrol right in the area because they were there within minutes. Um, and again, I just kept trying to keep him covered up and just kept holding his head and just looking, you know, down into his eyes and just said, "Keep, just stay with me, Mike, and it's gonna be fine." So I'm talking to Tyler Tromley, one of the deputies, and he says, "I've just finished my EMT training." He says, "I think I can help." So he grabs grabs a blanket and some gear and gets on Dave's sled and takes it back up to the scene. So he showed up and said, I'm an EMT, I'm here to help. So that was a great sense of relief. Um, he actually was a local sheriff who was on patrol, so he wasn't really prepared to do EMT work. Um, so when he came down the embankment, which is, it was very steep, um, it was a struggle for him. Um, he did have a blanket. We were able to cover Mike up and get him a little warmer. Although, you know, he really didn't want to be covered, but we knew that he might get hit with their hand. Uh, finally, a first responder came. Uh, name was Deb from Bridgewater, and she didn't have snowmobile clothing on or boots or anything like that, but she thought she could help. I think somebody gave her a pair of gloves, and I gave her a ride up the trail and dropped her off. She was able to come down. She got some hand warmers. We are trying to get Mike warm. You know, again, just I'm just trying to stay with him, be Mike, and trying to talk him through everything. Um, it just seemed like it took a really, really long time. Um, felt like at least an hour and a half. And then other EMT members started to arrive. I went up through the park and um, at that point had talked on my two-way radio and found out the exact location and took 
the Y track and the rescue sled backboard and blankets and stuff like that all to the scene. And little by little the rescue first responders came to the scene. I gathered up like three people that went with me to go help transport people if it was necessary. We got a neck collar on, on Mike, we got some oxygen on him, we got him on the backboard and I, don't, I can't even tell you how many individuals, probably at least eight or ten men and women trying to lift this backboard up to the embankment. Um, they had a rope, they pulled, we were able to get him out and into the back of um, Spike and the Plymouth. Um, sled, rescue sled. The trail was fairly smooth, it was nice, but it, it took us 10-15 minutes to get out of there in the rescue sled just because you know you're going two miles an hour. And two people got on each side of the sled standing on the skis. Spike was in the front and his brother Art was in the back as a brakeman hooked to the back of the sled and they finally started working their way down the trail down some steep hills and made it out to the road. At that point, we loaded him in the ambulance and uh, I believe then they called DART and DART landed 15 minutes or so later. The ambulance crew was awesome. They jumped right out, everybody pitched in. We got Mike right on board and they started working on him immediately, um, doing, you know, behind closed doors. Okay, he's got some broken bones. He may have some broken ribs, but bones can heal. And we thought the hard part was behind us. We got him into the ambulance. I felt a sense of relief that, okay, this, this is great, you know, we're on our way. I gave Rick a big hug and he called his daughter and, you know, so I would check in. And then I left. I got in my truck and I went to the emergency room and I asked the receptionist where my family was because I didn't see him in the sitting area. And he said, go through the double doors to the first door on the right, there's a family room, they're in there. So I go in there and there's all these other people in the room. And my wife and daughter are all crying, and the baby's crying. And there's a clergy person in there, and there's a social worker and a nurse. And I'm saying, what's going on? And they, somebody said, he didn't make it. And I said, what do you mean he didn't make it? He had broken bones, how could he not make it? And they said, no, he didn't make it. And I said, what's going on? How could he not make it? And they said he had internal bleeding. The aorta arch on the side of the heart was cut and it was bleeding and they couldn't keep up with it and he passed away and he didn't make it. I said, oh, this is unbelievable. I can't believe this is happening. Well, it was happening. So, um, we process and do what we had to do to get everybody back home and start what you do in those situations. Now, here's the thing. You could tell me a thousand times that this was not my fault. And I get it, I understand that. But you know what? Maybe it wasn't my fault, but maybe I could have prevented it. And here's how. When we were sitting at that road crossing, before we made our last trip home, all I had to do was say something as simple as, Mike, there's some steep hills and sharp turns coming up. Be careful, I'll see you back in the parking lot and maybe, he would have, maybe it would have made a difference, okay? Maybe it wouldn't have, but maybe it would have. And I, gotta, I think about that almost every day. Could have I made a difference? I'm trying to save a life, and I'm trying to make people realize that um, even though you're out there trying to have fun, you need to be responsible. And if I could save one life by touching somebody making them responsible and save one family from going through this type of tragedy, then this time is well spent. And that's my message. Please be responsible and ride carefully out there. Thank you. This is Hunter, and if Hunter could talk, he would say, my daddy was killed in a snowmobile accident when I was 11 days old, and we'll never get to play ball together or go fishing. So please be careful and responsible when you're out on the trails. Thank you.